So do you want your exams back? Yeah, no. Well, I'm going to give them back anyway. So hopefully you had a nice break. And now you are ready to have a very interactive class. OK. Okay, any comments or questions regarding the exam? I did post the key online. It would be good for you guys to go over the key. And if you'd like to meet with me and discuss your answers, I'm happy to do so. Um, just let me know. Also, if you'd like me to go over anything in class in terms of understanding the question, the style, the answer, I can do that. If you're not ready now with questions, we can discuss that next time, too. OK, I just want to make sure that you know the answers and you're comfortable with, with how the questions are being asked and such. OK. Continue. We kind of attempted to start the enzyme lecture before spring break, and it was interrupted twice. Uh, let's see. Let's have some recap questions in order to be able to carry on with the enzymes. Hopefully, I finish it today. And if there's time, I'll start the milk proteins. If not, we'll start dairy proteins next week. First presentation is on April 5th, right? And we agreed on your, we, you, we have not agreed on the two papers yet. You need to do that this week, because next week I need to see your slides. OK? So we need to make sure that you guys are ready. All right. OK. So define KM. Shake the spring break off. Welcome back. What is KM? Without reading, clear. <laughs> Try to just say anything related to KM. I'm really going to be a pain in the rear today and insist that you guys participate. I just don't like lecturing a lot, do you? Yeah, so. <laughs> I get to lecture, yeah. But it gets boring if you don't talk to me. What's KM? What does it tell us? Why is it important? say something. Okay, okay, I'm just going to sit here and wait. Huh? I mean, you, okay, you can look and then answer. Yeah, we need to know KM before continuing with the lecture. So how well the substrate binds to the enzyme, in other words, the affinity, it's an indication of the affinity of an enzyme to the substrate. Okay, in mathematical terms, what is Km? Is KM in mathematical terms? OK. Yeah. 
It's a substrate concentration. You said few words, but not in the right order. So it's a substrate concentration when V max is half V max. Yes. So it's the substrate concentration at which the velocity is half V max. Okay. So the higher the Km, the higher the affinity, right, of the enzyme to the substrate. The lower the affinity, yes, thank you. So the higher the Km, the lower the affinity. That means you need more substrate to reach half V max. That means you have less affinity. Okay. Good. We established that. What are types of inhibitors? Can you list the types of inhibitors? In competitive inhibitors. Under competitive inhibitors, not under competitive. So are they reversible or irreversible? Reversible. Other than competitive inhibitors, we have, so uncompetitive and non-competitive, so three types. So. When we say competitive inhibitor, what does that mean? The inhibitor and the substrate, Compet in competitive inhibition, yes, so the inhibitor competes with the substrate for the active site. Fine. Non-competitive inhibition. The inhibitor binds at a different site and changes the configuration of the binding site or the active site. Uncompetitive is neither. The enzyme binds to the substrate, and then the inhibitor binds, preventing the reaction from moving forward. So it binds to a different spot on the enzyme when the enzyme and the substrate are already bound. So it binds to the ES complex. All right? So. For each of these inhibitors, the competitive, non-competitive, and uncompetitive, how do, how do the Km and Vmax change? So what hap if we take the competitive inhibition, what happens to Km and Vmax in the presence of inhibitor? Do they stay the same, increase, decrease? Km increases, the affinity to the substrate is decreased, unless you have very high concentration of substrate, then it's not impacted. At lower concentration of substrate, your affinity to the substrate decreases, but once the enzyme and substrate are complex, the rate of the reaction proceeds at the same rate. So Vmax remain the same at when the enzyme is saturated with the substrate. So that's not impacted. What? is the case for non-competitive inhibition when the enzyme configuration is changed once the inhibitor is bound. The affinity does not, is not impacted, but the rate is impacted. So Vmax becomes lower, and then Km stays the same. Okay. And in case of uncompetitive inhibition, you have a parallel slope to the, to the line Weaver-Berg plot. That means Km increases and Vmax decreases. You just switch upwards. OK, so what does this figure tells us about the effect of enzyme concentration on the rate of the reaction? One, two, three, four is increasing concentration of the enzyme. So what happens to the rate of the reaction when the enzyme concentration is changing from this curve? What do you see? What's happening to the slope? Yeah. Yes. So the rate of the reaction increases with an increase in enzyme concentration. But your prediction becomes inaccurate if your time is not where you're supposed to measure. 
Because if you take 10 minutes, for example, if we say A is 10 minutes, at the highest enzyme concentration, your prediction line is way off than the actual because you have depletion of the substrate. And then you, your curve, instead of be continuing to be linear, becomes curved. So you cannot do accurate um, prediction. So we have to select the enzyme concentration and the time that allows accurate prediction where your reaction rate is linear. Where, yeah, whereas the relationship between the product and time is linear. So if I want 10 minutes, probably concentration, the second concentration would be good enough. Uh, we don't have to go to the third or fourth. Okay. So what are some factors that affect the rate of the enzymatic reaction other than the enzyme concentration? Temperature. So we need optimum temperature for the enzyme to function. As the temperature increases, the rate of the reaction increases until the protein, which is the enzyme, gets denatured. Then the rate of the reaction will decrease. Uh, other than temperature, pH. Again, we have optimum pH for optimal ionization of the binding site or the active site in order for the substrate to bind to your uh, enzyme. Okay, what else? There is the substrate concentration, there is the presence of cofactors, um, inhibitors, presence of inhibitors. Okay, why is enzyme kinetics important? To understand or learn? We asked this probably three times already. Because enzymes in food um, applications are used, so we need to understand the kinetics in order to choose the enzyme for a certain application, or in order to inhibit a particular enzyme, or in order to understand the activity of an enzyme for an application, or the use of an enzyme to determine constituents in analysis. So it's very important that we understand kinetics because of the importance of enzymes in food applications and foods in general. Okay. Here are some examples. Oh, any questions? <laughs> Do you have any questions on enzymes in general before moving on? Okay. So here's, here's a homework for you guys. I need each one of you to come up with a question next week about anything related to the class. Okay, for a plus two. How about that? Good? All right. All right, here's an example of an en enzyme kinetics and the use of it to determine um, inhibitors' activities or identify types of inhibitors. And this is an example done um, by myself and another student when I was a postdoc at Purdue. We were looking at plasmin activity and plasmin inhibitors. Plasmin is a native enzyme in milk. It impacts the milk quality. It hydrolyzes casein. And when, when casein is hydrolyzed in milk over shelf life of the milk, you will have sedimentation. Although the milk will not be bad to drink, but it would, from a quality perspective, it's not desirable for consumers. So, but there are native inhibitors that are present in milk. So we were looking at the type of inhibitors and how to inactivate the enzyme and keep the inhibitors active. Okay. Um, so we ran, we extracted plasmin and extracted plasma inhibitors from milk, and we ran the kinetics. We got a synthetic substrate, and we ran the uh, assay with no inhibitor. This is the assay with no inhibitor here, the black dots. And then the gray squares is when we had inhibitor in the system. And here are some of the data we um, got KM values, Vmax value from plotting the curves and 
getting the equation of the line. Okay? So the V max is 1 over, the intercept is 1 over V max, and the slope gives you the Km. If you remember this line weaver berg plot, I'm going to go back to remind you of the equation so that you know what I'm talking about. If I can, ah, here we go. So your intercept is 1 over V max, and then the slope Km over V max. If you have the V max, you can calculate Km by having the slope of the equation of the line. OK. So after plotting and getting the uh, Km value, V max, K cat, K cat over Km is the catalytic efficiency. Looking at these values, the presence of inhibitor, what type of inhibitor is that by looking at the values? If you want to determine whether it's um, competitive, non-competitive, uncompetitive, so why is it competitive, mycin? By looking at the values. Okay. So yeah, Vmax is very similar. What about Km? Increased. This is negative 2. This is negative 1. So Km went higher, Vmax stayed the same, and then the catalytic efficiency, Kcat over Km, went down, sevenfold almost. So when the Km increases and Vmax stays the same, this is competitive inhibition. Let's look at this. So polyphenol oxidase, which is the enzyme for browning that is the cause for over 50% of produce loss. So produce, I mean vegetables and fruits loss due to browning. So this is a very trouble, uh, troublesome enzyme. So people looked at ways of inhibiting this enzyme, and one of the ways was using inhibitors. Okay, so then in this graph here, it illustrates two types of inhibition. The green with parahydroxybenzoic acid, and then the purple with phenylthiourea. So which one of these are competitive inhibitor? The green or the purple? Competitive inhibition other than mycin. Okay, the green. And the other one, is it non-competitive or uncompetitive? Non-competitive inhibition. So the non-competitive inhibition, the affinity to the substrate is not different. However, the Vmax is lower. Okay, so we prefer to have non-competitive inhibitors because with competitive inhibition, if you have higher amount of substrate, it won't matter that the action will proceed because then you reach saturation and the Vmax is the same. But when you have lower rate, that means you need less inhibitor at any substrate level. So this is more desirable to have a non-competitive inhibition over competitive inhibition because of the fact that it's not impacted by substrate level. So the, one, the few things we need to keep in mind when choosing a, a, a non-competitive inhibitor, first of all, what's the cost of using that? Safety, is it safe to use? What's the legal status? Does it have grass? Um, what's the quantity that can be used? And does it impact at all the sensory uh, aspects, flavor, color, taste? Well. We're trying not to have color. But. So always remember that non-competitive inhibition, if these, if the cost is considerably low, if it's safe and has a legal status, 
then it's always preferable to have non-competitive inhibition because regardless of the substrate concentration, the rate will be lower at low inhibitor concentration. So often, your measurement of enzyme activity is based on spectrophotometric methods. So, and when we use these methods, often we are trying to determine unit of activity rather than concentration of the enzyme. Do you know the difference when we say unit of activity? We always have a standard enzyme, and we prepare different concentration of that standard enzyme, and then we determine unit of activity of the enzyme that is in our system based on the standard curve. But what is the difference between unit of activity and concentration of enzyme? You are very close. It's, if we want to look at the definition, and this is a college ball question actually, and we lost one time when it was asked at national. So what is the unit of activity? It's the amount in moles of a substrate that gets converted per unit time. Okay? So amount of substrate or number of moles of substrate that gets converted to a product per unit time at the particular pH and temperature. Because different temperature, different pH will have different rate. So, and usually one unit of activity is either one, it depends on the enzyme, either one mole of substrate converted per minute, or one micromole, or one nanomole, it depends, it's just one mole or one unit of a substrate converted per unit time. The concentration of an enzyme is, because the enzyme is a protein, it's basically how much protein you have. That's the concentration of enzyme. So that's the difference. Concentration of enzyme is how much enzyme you have in terms of a protein content versus the actual activity of that enzyme. So one milligram of an enzyme will have a different unit of activity than another milligram of a different enzyme. So. <clears throat> When we are measuring enzyme activity, your substrate concentration, you want it to be equal Km, much greater than Km, or much less than Km. When we are measuring enzyme activity. Okay. Go back. Here, is it first order or zero order with respect to substrate? Zero order with respect to substrate. So here, the enzyme impacts the rate, the concentration of the enzyme impacts the rate of the reaction. So it's zero order with respect to substrate, first order with respect to enzyme. So if I'm measuring enzyme activity, I want to be here. I want my enzyme to be saturated with the substrate. I want to make sure I have enough enzyme much greater than Km so that the reaction is not influenced by the substrate. I can measure rate of the reaction based on the concentration of the enzyme. So it's first order with respect to enzyme, zero order with respect to substrate. So when I'm measuring enzyme, I want my substrate concentration to be much greater than Km. I want my substrate not to be the limiting factor. I want my enzyme to be saturated with substrate. So there are so many different ways you can state the same thing. Enzyme saturated with substrate, reaction zero order with respect to substrate, 
And then the first order with respect to enzyme. Reaction rate is first order with respect to enzyme. You always measure product formation or substrate depletion, depending on your assay, and depending on what absorbs light in your assay. Okay, going back. All right, so oftentimes you hear the term coupled reaction. Are you familiar with this coupled reaction? A lot of, a lot of assays are actually coupled reaction assay, like the determination of glucose concentration is a coupled reaction enzymatic assay. So coupled reaction meaning you have two reactions going on with two enzymes. The first reaction is the measuring reaction or the auxiliary reaction. Either measuring or auxiliary is the same thing. And the second reaction is the indicator reaction or the indicating reaction. The first reaction, you get neither the substrate nor the products absorb light. The, the, one of the products from the first reaction is converted in the second reaction using a second enzyme to a product that absorbs light. So you have two enzymes in the system. In order to set up a coupled reaction, you want to make sure that both enzymes are functioning at similar pH. Otherwise, you will have a problem. You will want to run the reaction at one pH and then adjust the reaction to the next pH, which is not efficient for enzymatic assay. So your first enzyme and second enzyme need to have very similar pH optima. That's a requirement for coupled reaction. Another requirement for coupled reaction is the second reaction is not in rate limiting. What does that mean? That means your second reaction occurs fast. It's not slow. As soon as product one is generated, your second reaction proceeds fast, so you can have a measurement fast. So the second reaction should not be the rate limiting reaction. Or it should, in other words, proceed faster than the first reaction. Otherwise, you'll have accumulation of P1, and then that will mess up your reaction rates. All right, here's an example of a coupled reaction. So you have a glucose, an ATP, a hexokinase, which is a transferase enzyme, one of the six classes, which transfer a phosphate group to glucose. And you, have a, you end up having glucose 6-phosphate and ADP. This product here is a reactant in the second reaction, the indicator reaction. So you have six glucose 6-phosphate with NADP in the presence of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. You end up with NADPH and ADPH that is the one that absorbs light here. NAD does not absorb light at a particular wavelength, and ADPH absorbs light. OK. Any questions on coupled reactions? All right. So moving on to the different enzyme classes, the main enzymes that have food application or implications in food are two main classes of enzymes, hydrolases and oxidoreductases. So under hydrolases, we have a bunch of them, and we'll give examples, uh, a bunch of examples about uses. And then oxidoreductases also, we have a few examples with one, one most important one that we try to inhibit often is phenol oxidase. OK, so what's the definition of a hydrolase enzyme from its, from its name? Huh? Does it produce water, or does it take up water? If you have a triglyceride 
and you want to break it into glycerol and fatty acids. Does it uptake water or give water? Uptake water. Because the water is, up, is taken up and the OH and H is taken up by the um, fatty acid and glycerol. Now peptide bond, covalent bond. Yeah, yeah, break peptide bonds, so glycerol bonds. So break covalent bonds in the presence of water where the elements of water are taken up. So that is a simple definition of hydrolases. So pectinase is pectinases are group are different enzymes. Pectinases are different types of pectinases that break. So pectin is used as a gelling agent, and um, the way it kind of thickens uh, and binds water and acts as a stabilizer is when there is a positive ion such as calcium here, and you have the carboxyl groups. The carboxyl groups negatively charge interact with uh, calcium and form bridges between different pectin molecules. So therefore, they can bind water and form a gel matrix. But you have methoxy pectins. So the carboxyl group is not really free. You have a methyl group. But if that is broken, the methyl group is link is taken off, you'll have more carboxyl groups free to interact with calcium. So you will have greater gelling power. So if you use an enzyme to break down the methoxy group, then you will have, uh, you reduce the degree of esterification, and therefore you have better gelling capability. So low methoxy pectin, less than 50% esterified with methyl groups, that usually form reversible gels in the presence of calcium. As the degree of esterification goes down, you have more gelling power. So pectinases also include polymethylgalacturinase and polygalacturinase. So you have the, the units of pectin are galacturonic acid, uranic acid, and galactose. So here's your galactose and here's the carboxyl group which makes it a galactouronose. <laughs> and then if it has a methyl, it will be methyl galactouronose. So you have two enzymes that can break these bonds. If you have methyl groups, then you will have the polymethyl galactouronase that will break the bond where you have methyl groups. And when you don't have methyl group, polygalactourinase will break that bond. So you need a mixture of both in order to hydrolyze pectin because of the fact that you have some, some of the groups are esterified to methyl. So these enzymes are often used in clarification of juices. So here's your apple juice, and here's a clarified apple juice. So in the industry of clarification of juices, pectinase enzymes are used. And some of them are endo or exo. So they're different types. Endo that breaks in the middle of the chain, and exo breaks one group at a time from the external proximities, extremities. So the pectin methyl esterase breaks, as I said, the methyl group resulting in negatively charged carboxyl groups. In the presence of calcium, these will polymerize and precipitate out. This is uh, one of the reasons of when you see the pulp 
separation are in juice. So therm thermal treatment usually is done to inhibit these enzymes so that you don't have pulp separation. If you want a pulpy orange juice, you want to make sure that you inhibit these enzymes. But if you don't care and you want to clarify, you actually add these enzymes to actually clarify, along with the uh, poly polygalacturinases. But often you want to inhibit this enzyme to prevent the pulp separation in an orange juice product that has rich or is rich in pulp. Here's a case study where an article actually was looking at the impact of high pressure uh, treatment to inhibit pectin methyl esterase in orange juices, actually. The reason is they, when you heat orange juice to high temperature to inactivate these enzymes, you're affecting flavor and color. So they're looking at other ways to inhibit this enzyme while maintaining flavor and color. So in this article, they were looking at the inactivation kinetics of polymeth uh, pectin methyl esterases using pressure ranging from 400 to 600 megapascal in combination with temperatures between 25 and 50 degrees. So they looked at the effect of high pressure along with the effect of the three different temperature, room temperature, their elevated temperature, and 50 degrees Celsius temperature. So here's what they found. So the rate of inhibition is represented by K, and D is the minutes to have one log reduction in inhibition. That means how many minutes before you get 90% um, reduction in inhibition. So they found as you increase pressure, you actually get a reduction in the activity. And then the impact of heat becomes more. So at 600 megapascal and 50 degrees Celsius, you have the highest rate of inhibition and the lowest time to get one log reduction in inhibition. Okay, amylase is another set of enzymes under hydrolases. These comprise alpha amylase, beta amylase, glucoamylase, and pollinase. So they hydrolyze mainly starch, amylose, and amylopectin. So you have the glucoamylases, which hydrolyze is an exoenzyme and hydrolyze one unit of glucose. You, you saw this somewhere else, right? You talk about it every day, okay. So uh, glucoamylase is an exoenzyme that hydrolyzes one glucose unit at a time from the external, um, from the outside of the polymer. Beta amylase is also an exoenzyme and it hydrolyzes two glucose units at a time, producing maltose, okay? And also it's an exoenzyme. And then you have alpha amylase, which is an enzyme specific for the alpha 1, 4 linkages. And it, it's an endoenzyme, so it breaks within the polymer. And then you have the polymase, which breaks alpha 1, 6 linkages that are abundant in amylopactin. So, you want, let's say, produce high fructose corn syrup. So mostly you have alpha amylase that breaks the starch into dextrins, different um, chains of dextrin with different dextrose equivalent or, um, yeah, with different molecular weight. And then you can produce different syrups maltodextrin syrups, actually. But if you want to produce it all the way to high fructose corn syrup, you can add glucoamylase, which I said glucoamylase can break alpha-1,4 linkages 
and it also can break alpha-1-6 linkages. So you get glucose, and the glucose is converted to fructose using isomerase, which is a different class. It's not a hydrolase enzyme. So it's an isomerase that converts the glucose to its isomer, fructose. And then you end up with a high fructose corn syrup. Does high fructose corn syrup cause cancer? Does it now? As food scientists, do you believe that high fructose corn syrup cause cancer? No. But some people, consumers, do believe that. Does high fructose corn syrup make you fatter than glucose? No. One gram has four calories, like any other gram of carbohydrates. So these are the unfortunate stereotyping about high fructose corn syrup. OK. Hydrolases, again, example is lactase, which is very much used in industry, especially for uh, lactose intolerance. Uh, people to produce lactose-free milk or lactose-free yogurt, lactose-free ice cream. So you add the lactose in to uh, lac lactase, and it converts lactose to glucose and galactose. Um, also, you can have them, actually, you can buy the enzyme as tablets, and you put them either on your food before you eat, or, or you just swallow it with the food. <laughs> yeah. Sucrase, or invertase, it's the same thing. It basically inverts sucrose, or breaks down sucrose into glucose and fructose, and it's also used in industry, because sucrose crystallizes. And if you want to prevent the crystallization of sugar during storage, you break it down to glucose and fructose. You actually end up having a little bit more sweeter product and a product that does not crystallize as much over storage. So here's the example. Have you ever had the cherry chocolate, ch chocolate covered cherry? Yeah. So this syrup right here is actually invert. Uh, sugar, so that the, this does not crystallize over time. When you bite into your cherry, you don't have the crystal, sandy feeling of crystallized sugar. Proteases is another huge class of hydrolases that have great and a lot of um, impact in food applications. So it impacts texture, flavor, and releases peptides that makes the product more bioactive in terms of physiological benefits. But if we want to look at texture, for example, curd formation in cheese is done using enzymes. And we'll talk more about that. Um, process when we talk about dairy proteins. But you use chymosin or renin enzyme to form the curd. Meat tenderization is also an impact on texture when you use papain or bromelain to tenderize meat steaks. Um, disruption of gels, the example that we, pineapple and forming a jelly, you don't want, or a, a jello. You don't want to use raw pineapple because of bromelain presence, because it will break down the proteins into small peptides, and the gel won't form. Aging of cheese, this is for development of flavor. So you have proteases, bacterial protease, proteases during the aging of cheese that will break down some proteins and release unique peptides for unique flavor. And sometimes you use uh, proteases to act on wheat gluten and make it um, less strong. So if you hydrolyze a little bit the gluten, then you can utilize a really strong flour. That means protein that is very thick in a flour and use it for different applications. That does not require that much strong gluten. So that's another impact on texture. 
So there are different classes of proteases, and they're often their names um, are derived based on the active group or a residue in the active site. So if we look at serine endoproteinases, uh, it has a serine hydroxyl group in the active site. Cysteine endoproteinases has a cysteine group that is in the active site. Metalloproteases, there are a bunch of them. That means they require a metallic like zinc or manganese in their active site for it to act. Um, some are differ in, they differ in sensitivity or selectivity. Selectivity of trypsin is highly selective, for example. It only cleaves after lysine and arginine, whereas pepsin is a, is a we call it peptidases usually because it's general um, to any peptide. It can break any peptide. So lipases is another hydrolase. It impacts flavor. You can tailor make certain lipids and to, for emulsification purposes. For example, the mono and diglycerol, so you have, you are produced by lipases where you cleave off emulsifiers used as emulsifiers. Lipases also have a role during fermentation, aging of cheese or fermenting of yogurt for a distinct flavor as well, same as proteases and aging of cheese. So what about oxidoreductases? What is the definition of oxidoreductases? From the name, does the name imply? Yeah, it oxidizes or reduces. Um, but what really happens during the reaction? What's being transferred during the reaction? Electrons or protons being transferred in the reaction. Uptake or get, um, uptake of oxygen or release of oxygen. So enzymes that oxidize or reduce substrate by transfer of hydrogen protons or electrons or by use of oxygen or irreducible of oxygen. So catalase, it hydrolyzes, or not hydrolyzes, it reduces um, peroxide. So the peroxide will be reduced to oxygen and water in the presence of catalase or peroxidase. If you say catalase and peroxidase, sometimes it's interchangeable. So, like I said, the most problematic enzyme that needs to be controlled or often attempted to be controlled is the polyphenol oxidase. So it causes browning, and it's an enzymatic browning, unlike the Miller reaction. So sometimes it's desirable you want the browning of tea, it's desirable. And other times, it's really not desirable. <laughs> That's a fresh shrimp that is a browned shrimp. And the shrimp, the name for that is shrimp melanosis, from the word melanin, which is the, the brown pigment that is generated at the end of the reaction and then produce. This is a browning of, of pears and, of course, of the apple. And many, many other vegetables and fruits are subject to loss due to browning. So you have Granny Smith apples, and you have the Arctic apples. Why don't they brown as fast? 
college board question. It is really. It can be. I don't know if it's in the bag. Genetically engineered. They're genetically engineered to have low levels or no levels of polyphenol oxidase. Low levels. I wouldn't say completely no polyphenol oxidase, but low level of that. So what's the chemistry of the reaction? So often you have the substrate present in the apple, let's say, or pear, or potato, or what have you. So you have the substrate, and the substrate is often a monophenol. That means you have a, a phenol group, a benzene ring with an OH, attached to an R group. That's the substrate. And then you have the enzyme in a separate compartment. Once the tissue is broken, when you cut an apple or cut a potato and expose it to oxygen, and the tissue is broken, the enzyme is exposed to the substrate in the presence of oxygen, the reaction starts. So you have two types of enzymes shown here, which are both polyphenol oxidase. Cresolase is the first one that converts a monophenol into a diphenol, still colorless product. And then you have the catecholase, which converts um, diphenol into quinone, where you have two carbonyls here. You end up with having uh, C double bond 2O. This, in the presence of amino acids and proteins, you end up having oxidative condensation. They can actually polymerize, and they can interact with amino acids and proteins and continue the polymerization. And you can form uh, complex brown polymers known as melanins. So this is the brown pigment. When once it's formed, it's formed. It's irreversible. But there is a section of the reaction that is reversible, which is converting the quinones back to diphenol. So if you have oxygen and you have the enzyme and the substrate, you get here. But if you have reducing agents, you can reduce it back to diphenol and prevent the um, movement of the reaction into the polymerization stage. So some of the reducing agents could be ascorbic acid, thiol product. That means you have a free SH groups that act as a reducing agent, like um, methionine, no, hold on, uh, glutathione, or even cysteine. Sodium bisulfite, which are also reducing agent, they can um, reduce the compound backwards. And the Pre presence of sulfide or sulfur dioxide, what happens, you can form an adduct, a sulfur adduct. So for this, quinone can form a sulfur adduct, and the reaction will not proceed to polymerization. So there are so many different ways that have been explored to inhibit this enzyme. Of course, heat inactivation, since it's a protein, denature that enzyme. Dehydration, removal of moisture. And use of a reducing agent, use of sulfites. So for example, sulfites are used a lot for dehydrated vegetables uh, and fruits to inhibit browning. Um, adjustment of the pH, make it acidic. Chelating agents, because of the enzyme, is requiring a metal form. And then aromatic inhibitors. So these are competitive inhibitors, benzoic acid, cinnamic acid, and ferulic acid. They are competitive inhibitors. They inhibit the enzyme. Modified atmosphere packaging, change the atmosphere. We have a case study that used aragon gas in the modified atmosphere packaging. Genetic engineering, such as the Granny Smith. Irradiation, high pressure processing. There are so many different ways that people explore to inhibit these PPOs. 
So before we go into first case study, I'll give you five minutes break. And we'll come back. What with the door?
We have everybody. All right. Let's continue. So here is a case, another case study, but they're looking at uh, polyphenol um, oxidase behavior in two different produce or varieties of peaches. And in order to determine which uh, peach variety is suitable for what processing application. So they did enzyme kinetics, and they looked at um, the specificity of the enzymes from the two different species for three different or two different substrates at different concentrations. And also they looked at three different inhibitors and concentrations. So, of course, they did kinetics, so they did line weaver Burk plot, they determined Vmax, Km, catalytic efficiency. So here they looked at different substrates, and by looking at Vmax and Km values, they determined that, and calculating Vmax over Km, which is an indication of the catalytic efficiency, they found that the substrate that is most or has most catalytic efficiency uh, is um, methyl catechol for the one PPO from one variety and then another the one, the pyrogallo from another variety. So basically it had low Km, high Vmax, although this has more Vmax, like 1321 in terms of a rate of the reaction compared to 33, but when they looked at Vmax over Km, which is an indication of the catalytic efficiency, the Km was so low that this value was much higher than the value above it, so they determined that this substrate is better, or uh, have higher efficiency with the enzyme than the catechol itself. And here it was, you had high, again, Vmax, low Km, so the catalytic efficiency was higher than the other two. So that's how they determined based on kinetics which substrate were more uh, resulted in higher efficiency of the enzymatic reaction. They looked at inhibitors, so, so what they did is they ran the assay in the presence of the different inhibitors with no inhibition and then three other inhibitors and they determined that two inhibitors were competitive based on having same Vmax but higher Km, whereas the third one, for one enzyme, they were not able to determine if it was competitive or not, given that it wasn't clear that the Vmax was the same, so they were not able to make that assertion, while it was also a competitive inhibitor for the, uh, this SU variety of the enzyme. And then you can see that the Km value was reduced, or uh, sorry, the Km value was reduced in the presence, not the Km value, this is the rate of the reaction, K1 was reduced. They don't show the Km value for some reason. The Km value would have gone higher but they didn't show it here. The second case study, here they looked at um, modified atmospheric packaging. They looked at the effect of aragon gas on the kinetics of the uh, polyphenol oxidase reaction. And they did that in presence of high aragon, high nitrogen atmospheres, in compared to high oxygen atmosphere. So 
in this case, aragon was a, was a um, competitive inhibitor to oxygen. So it acted competing with oxygen, uh, given its size. So if you look at the Km value, so the highest all right, so looking at, again at this and the values here, is it a competitive, non-competitive, or uncompetitive? Hmm? So looking at the figure and looking at the values, it's competitive inhibition. Because you have same Vmax, it's not changing, but the Km values are changing. The highest Km was in the presence of the highest percentage of aragon. And for mush the PPO extracted from mushroom and the PPO extracted from apple, again, um, the highest aragon concentration resulted in the highest Km. So it's a competitive inhibition. Glucose oxidase is uh, used in analysis. Um, mostly the assay for determining glucose. So that's, and this is also used when you are determining total starch or gelatinized starch, non-gelatinized starch. No, not no. Gelatinized and retrograded starch. It's a different assay. But if you're determining total starch, and or you're just determining total glucose in your sample. This is a very common assay where you use glucose oxidase. You get a peroxide. The peroxide is involved in the second reaction. So this is your auxiliary reaction, and this is the indicator reaction. So here you have a reduced dye peroxide. In the presence of peroxidase, you get an oxidized dye, and that's what you measure uh, the reading, the absorbance of. Okay. Glucose oxidase is also used in active packaging as an oxygen scavenger. So the enzyme is immobilized within the package, either um, on a support system as a metal, glass, nylon, cellulose, and it's entrapped in a gel matrix, so it captures any oxygen that is in the packaging itself or that can penetrate through the package. So it scavenges those, this oxygen and acts as an um, active packaging, preventing oxidation that might occur during storage. So what are some applications for immobilized enzyme that you know of in industry. Immobilized, that means enzymes that have been immobilized on a surface as a membrane, for example. Yeah, I don't know of that, but it could be. Did Gary talk about that? Okay. <laughs> All right. So that is one application. What else do you know of other than this application? Lactases can be immobilized to hydrolyze lactose in milk. Um, production of protein hydrolysates. So you can have a membrane reactors or you have the enzyme immobilized and you pass your protein solution through the membrane reactors and the enzymes hydrolyze the protein, produce protein hydrolysate, and the enzyme is available for the next batch. Um, let's see what else. High fructose corn syrup can be produced by immobilized enzymes. And for analytic purposes, analysis, you can use ELISA. And ELISA utilizes an immobilized enzyme by linking an, an antibody to an enzyme or an antigen to an enzyme for that assay. Okay. 
So looking at enzymes in baking, here's a table that summarizes the use of different enzymes for baking. Amylases, some, some are endogenous amylases in the flour itself that can help in fermentation of the dough because amylases chop um, the starch and provide more sugar for the yeast. So it enhances fermentation. Uh, proteases, it improves handling and rheology property. That's when you use some protease to hydrolyze the gluten if the gluten is too strong. So you can reduce its elasticity and promote more viscosity and extensibility. Um, glutamyl transferase, it has a different name as well. Do you remember the other name for Transglutaminase is the same as uh, gluta, uh, glutamyl transferase, so that if you see one or the other, it's the same thing. And it improves dough elasticity by linking protein. It's kind of like a glue. It causes polymerization of proteins, resulting in better um, dough rheology. Sulfhydryl oxidase, for example, it causes oxidation of sulfidyl groups, promoting formation of SS linkages and strengthening of the dough. So here's the um, transglutaminase or the glutamyl transferase. So, um, so you have a, a glutamine and lysine. They interact via covalent linkage in the presence of the enzyme glutaminase and an ammonia is released and then you get a covalent linkage and hence a polymerization or cross-linking. So this for example in rice bread since rice does not have gluten protein, gluten forming proteins, it's it will not form a strong dough in order to form bread from rice. So if you add this enzyme, it will enhance cross-linking and you'll get some sort of a loaf out of rice. So the actual reaction is with uh, amine group of a lysine residue with the carboxyamide group of glutamine. The carboxyamide group is this group and then the amine group of lysine is here. So that's the reaction that occurs, and then you get a release of ammonia. Enzymes relevant in milk and dairy, not diary, I just noticed that. It's dairy, and this is table published in a book. Okay. Um, anyway, dairy pro the products, so chymosin is the renin enzyme for milk coagulation or generation of the curd, uh, proteases and lipases, we talked about flavor generation of these hydrolases, the sulfhydryl oxidase removes cooked flavor, the sulfur uh, flavor, the galactosidase or the lactase remover of lactose, and then microbial proteases, I don't know why that is in here either. This is soy, not milk and <laughs> dairy products. Why am I noticing this just now? Okay, yeah, so they use proteases to hydrolyze a little bit and enhance coagulation of soy milk. Yeah. In milk, yeah, well, one would think it's dairy milk, right? But you're right, maybe that's the confusion. Okay. Also enzymes to remove unwanted constituents. Again, that, that's your lactose, removal of peroxide, and then removal of better peptides, and also hydrolyzing inhibitors or protease inhibitors as well. So there are other examples, but these are just highlights. So, Using use, usage of enzyme in analysis other than just glucose like we talked about, we can measure other constituents such as sulfide because P 
people have some people have sensitivity to sulfite, so you need to report the sulfite in, on your label. So you need to measure that starch. You use enzymes to hydrolyze starch to glucose, and then an enzyme assay to analyze for glucose content. D-malic acid is um, an indication that, for example, the apple juice is not um, natural apple juice, synthetic apple juice, or not synthetic apple juice. What's that? Adulterated apple juice will have D-malic acid rather than L-malic acid. L-malic acid is a natural organic acid present in apple juice, but if you have adulterated apple juice is not made up of natural apple juice, you'll find D-malic acid in there, and that would be um, an adulteration, basically. So you can use enzyme assays to determine the, these constituents as an example. And when you're determining constituents, you need the, the reaction to be first order with respect to substrate. In order to have the reaction first order with respect to substrate, your substrate concentration would be much less than K. That's when the curve is linear. Um, and impacted by the concentration of the substrate. Or the rate of the reaction is impacted by the concentration of the substrate. And it would be zero order with respect to the enzyme. So you need to have en enough enzyme concentration so that it's not the limiting factor that's impacting the rate of the reaction. Also, you measure activity of enzymes in different uh, foods or for different uh, processing um, impact on processing. So for blanching, you measure either peroxidase and lipophagenase to determine the efficiency of blanching. Uh, for uh, flour, wheat flour, you often determine alpha amylase activity because if it's too high, you'll end up with a lot of starch being hydrolyzed, and then you will have less viscosity of the starch, and that's lower functionality for the flour. So you, you can either measure alpha amylase as a measure of enzyme assay, or you can do another test that is indicative of alpha amylase activity. Do you remember what that was? It's a qualitative kind of assay you would do, and it's not measuring ac directly the activity of the enzyme. The falling number, have you heard of that? So it's bas basically you have the flour and water, and then you have a kind of a plunger, and then you have a, a measuring cylinder can form a paste, and then you determine the amount of time the plunger needs to fall a certain distance. So the more distance it falls in a certain amount of time, that means you have higher falling number, that means higher alpha amylase activity. The starch has become less viscous due to hydrolysis. Also, another example is used using the uh, assay, enzymatic acid determined rennet activity. And as I said a few weeks ago, this is important when you're determining how much rennet you need when you are forming a certain amount of um, cheese, because you want to be the most efficient, the less enzyme uh, possible for the maximum amount of product within a unit time. So it's important to measure the activity of the rennet you have before addition in order to determine how much of the enzyme is needed to generate a certain amount of curd in a certain amount of time. Other applications of enzymes that are not directly related to food per se but are used in assay to determine the bioactivity 
of a certain food constituents. Have you heard of angiotensin converting enzyme? No? Okay. This, in, uh, this enzyme has to do with uh, high blood pressure in our body. So here's an animation. So when the body detects low blood pressure, when for some reason you get low blood pressure, the kidney produces uh, renin. The renin converts an angiotensinogen, it's a hormone, inactive hormone, to an active hormone angiotensin 1, where this enzyme, the angiotensin converting enzyme, converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which is a vasoconstrictor. So it regulates the blood pressure. So you have a dilated vessel, it makes it less dilated, and the blood pressure becomes normal. But some people with high blood pressure, they have a very active system very hyperactive system. That means they constantly produce a lot of this enzyme and a lot of this renin here. So you always, they're always producing a lot of the angiotensin II, which results in um, really very constricted vessel and a high blood pressure. So. In order to control high blood pressure, people with high blood pressure take medication, captopril, which has a lot of side effects. So people have been looking, researchers, into alternative medicine, which is by active peptides. That means proteins that have been hydrolyzed, releasing peptides with activity that results in inhibition of this enzyme. So this, the peptides act as comparative inhibitors to this substrate. The peptides which are produced upon enzymatic hydrolysis, so you have soy protein, there's a research we've done a few years back, hydrolyzed soy protein resulted in protein hydrolysate, and we wanted to determine whether or not these hydrolysate are potent or can inhibit this, can result and reduction in hypertension or prevention of hypertension. So in order to determine if these peptides have angiotensin converting enzyme inhibition activity, so we did an enzyme assay. We obtained ACE enzyme and we obtained a synthetic substrate similar to angiotensin 1 and we did the assay with and without the peptides we generated to determine if they were able to inhibit this enzyme. So here's the enzymatic assay. So the, in the enzymatic assay, we measured the absorption of the substrate. So when the enzyme converts the substrate to product, the absorption goes down. So that's why it's a downward reaction, okay? So the downward, downward slope, I mean. So Without inhibitor, just the reaction without the inhibition, you have the steepest slope, you have the highest rate. No, there's no inhibition. You have the enzyme ACE with the substrate, and the substrate is being converted to product, you have the highest rate, so you have the highest slope. When we put the hydrolysate, we used two different enzymes, we wanted to know which enzyme produced the better hydrolysate, you can see that the slope of the reaction became flatter. So that means the reaction rate became s slower. So the enzyme pepain resulted in the most reduction in the slope. So you have the flatter slope here compared to the pepsin. So we concluded that hydrolyzing soy protein isolate with pepain under the conditions of the assay we tested had the most reduction in enzyme activity. So this means that this hydrolysate had more potent peptides able of inhibiting the ACE. So we made a claim that we produced hydrolysate with high physiological activity, yet to be proven in vivo.
This is an in vitro assay. We just say that they are capable of inhibiting this enzyme, but a lot of, in order to confirm and make a label claim, we need human trials. But this is just an example where enzyme assays can be used as well, other than the traditional food applications. Have you heard of patulin? So what is patulin? You guys, have you heard of patulin? Do you know what patulin is? No? Is it pink? <laughs> you remember that? You were here when Brian was here? Okay. So it's a mycotoxin. Patulin is a mycotoxin. This is the formula of patulin. And the reason of the apple and the little boy, it was meant to be a joke that was Brian when he was a kid. No, <laughs> he's, he's blonde. Um, and the apple is because patulin is um, a mycotoxin produced by fungus that can grow in apples. And the most common fungus is actually penicillium, expansum, and that produces patulin in apples. And there was a few years back, Papen Heights, you know Papen Heights company? They had a major recall, actually. So they had apple juice, I think, yeah, that the government found higher level of patulin in their juice than is allowed. And then they came to us. Pepin Heights came to us and, and, the, and then they asked us to find ways for them to better detect patulin because the, their methods indicated that they had lower level than the government uh, values. And also they asked if we can find a solution for high patulin in their apples and their juices. So when Okay, we said, okay, we will try. We applied for a grant through the University of Minnesota, Rapid Agriculture Response Grant, and we were funded, and we were reading about it, and we found that if you, ha if you ferment the apple juice and produce apple cider, you don't have patulin, even if you start with high level of patulin. So from our readings, we thought, okay, so it must be something happening during fermentation that results in the degradation of patulin. So what could happen during fermentation other than enzymatic degradation? So what the hypothesis was that we get specific strains that are usually present during fermentation and then extract protein from these strains and determine enzyme activity. And we did that. We got two different types of strains. We extracted the protein and we measured the activity of the protein in the presence of patulin. So we have patulin and we added the protein extract and then we incubated and then we measured patulin again using HPLC. And we determined the loss in patulin over time of the assay. And we found actually that um, depending on the strain, some strains have more activity than other strains. So we kind of proved that the degradation of patulin is actually enzymatic degradation. So how, how is that of relevance to the industry, to Papen Heights and other industry? We did not complete this research as funding ran out, but if we had more money, we would have, um, and more money and more time and more Brian's, uh, we would have taken the crude protein extract and subjected it to chromatography to isolate the enzyme that was responsible for degradation of that patulin. So do activity fractionation um, using chromatography. And if, we're able, if we succeeded, we would have provided a solution in such a way that, okay, this is the 
enzyme that causes degradation. So they can run the juice through membranes with immobilized enzyme that degrade patulin and therefore get rid of their patulin by doing so. But it's unfortunate. I mean, we never got, we never pursued this, but maybe one day we should. Okay. That's, I think, it for enzymes. Any burning question? Are you burning to leave? We have 15 more minutes. Uh, yeah. Well, the company did not give us funding. Actually, the university did. Yeah. Did Yes, it would have been smart from me if I pursued that too, but I just graduated Brian and moved on to something else. Yeah, I should, uh, yeah, it would have been good to um, have them fund that. Okay. We'll start. Huh. My closing this. I thought I saved it, but oh well. We'll start milk proteins. I know we're not going to go far, but we'll just give it a go. Again with the map. So where we are here, we already talked about intrinsic and factors, extrinsic factors that impact protein structure. And we talked about functionality. What we're going to talk about in this section, we're going to talk about the different sources of proteins and the different structure of the different proteins and how they impact functionality and how they differ in functionality. So we'll talk about dairy proteins, soy protein, gluten proteins, so the different types of proteins, basically. So here we are. We are in this section of this map. So milk proteins, or milk proteins is one category of different proteins used in food systems or food applications. So if they are used as ingredients, we have casein proteins. Mostly the ingredients that are used are sodium caseinate and calcium caseinate. But there are others emerging, like the micellular casein, for example, is an emerging ingredient. And we'll talk about how each ingredient is produced later on in this lecture. Um, there are the whey proteins. You have the concentrates and isolates. Concentrates, when you hear the term concentrate, usually the protein is can be anywhere between 35 to 80 percent protein. So you can find whey protein concentrate 35 by its name. That means it has 35 percent protein. You can have a 50 by its name. That means 50 percent protein. Or 80, that means 80 percent protein. Isolates, if you hear the term isolate, it's often 90 percent minimum protein but it can go up to 95 or 96 percent protein. <clears throat> so, and protein concentrate and isolates are produced using different techniques. And again, we will talk about that in, in the, towards the end of the protein, this protein lecture. Soy protein is another main protein ingredient. It can be uh, in three different forms. Soy flour, which is rich in proteins, at least 50% protein, so it's, it's high in protein, so that's why it's used as an ingredient as is. You have a more concentrated form, which is the soy protein concentrate, at least 80% protein, 78, I would say, to 80% protein. And then you have the isolate, which is at least 90% protein. Other proteins, you have the egg proteins, the albumin, which is the egg white, and then you have the yolk proteins that are used 
mainly egg white is used as an ingredient more than the yolk. Uh, cereal proteins, other than their use as for baked products, they can be an ingredient that is added to for a baked product application. You can actually add vital gluten for certain application to your wheat flour or any other flour that you're using to produce a baked product. Meat proteins, you have the gelatin, of course, and then you have the myofibril proteins for different applications. So these are the, the kind of the dinosaurs <laughs> of the protein ingredient um, industry. So they've been there for years, and now there is a kind of a, the industry is blooming, the protein industry is blooming, and people are going crazy over protein ingredient, and they want to generate protein ingredient from almost everything. So ask Claire about it. So there are a lot of different sources now that are emerging. Pulses is a big one. The closest to being really big and huge now is pea protein. And then uh, other oil seeds other than soybean. Camelina is one. Claire is working on that. There are a couple others. There's Silphium is an oil seed. Pencrest is an oil seed that is high in protein. And uh, they're looking into the protein source and oils as an additional oil source and protein source. Potato. They say that potato protein is very functional, even better than whey protein. But imagine the cost for producing potato protein. You have a potato, and the protein concentration in the potato is like this much. I don't know, 1%. So it is very costly to produce potato proteins, but it seems like they're very, very uh, functional. There's the almond protein, algae protein, and insect protein. If you were at IFT last year, there were several symposiums on algae and insect protein. So we're not going to cover insect protein in this class. Um, we'll start with the dinosaurs, and among them are the milk proteins. Yeah. Yes. More proteins, you mean? Actually, there is the, the microbial proteins as well. That's another one that is emerging. emerging. Okay. You, can, you can use yeasts in bacteria to produce proteins for food application. So you could technically or possibly get more protein in the potato? Oh, I see. Genetically engineer the potato to get more protein in it. Yeah, you, potentially you can do anything you want with genetic engineering. but. <laughs> Yeah, but I haven't heard that it's been done with potatoes. Yeah. High protein potatoes. Haven't seen that yet. But it's not impossible. Okay. So let's dissect milk proteins. All right. So we have in milk, we have 3 to 4% protein. Of this percentage, you have the casein proteins, you have enzymes, and you have whey proteins. So obviously the enzymes are present in very, 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 very small concentration. So the bulk of the proteins are mainly casein. So 80% of the 3 to 4% is casein proteins, and 20% of the 3 to 4% are whey protein. So, if we want to look at the enzymes, there are a whole bunch of enzymes in milk. But among the most relevant or studied enzymes are the plasmin enzyme, because it impacts quality of milk. It has been studied a lot. There is the, they call it the plasmin uh, system in milk. They, they call it plasmin system because you have the zymogen, do you know what a zymogen is? Inactive form of an enzyme, which is plasminogen, is the inactive form of plasmin. So in milk, you have plasminogen. You have plasminogen activators. 
That means activators that convert plasminogen to plasmin. And then you have uh, plasmin, the enzyme, and then you have plasmin inhibitors. So this whole system is present in milk, and the thermal treatment can impact each one of them and result in a certain combination in the end product. And up to date, there's still research on how to limit plasmin activity in milk using non-thermal and thermal processing because it's been a um, cause of problem for years. Okay, so, so that's the most studied system. And then the alkaline phosphatase is very known, much known, because it's the enzyme that is monitored to determine the effectiveness of uh, pasteurization. So since it is the most thermal stable enzyme. It's more thermally stable than any pathogen. If it gets inactivated upon pasteurization, that means pasteurization was successful and all pathogens have been killed. So instead of doing a micro-testing that takes two days to determine the presence of pathogens, they would measure alkaline phosphatase to determine the effectiveness of pasteurization. So these two are among the most studied uh, endogenous enzymes in milk. Okay. Under beta casein, I'm oh, sorry, under casein proteins, you have four types of caseins. You have alpha S1, alpha S2, beta casein, and kappa casein. Each one of them have specific role and specific functionality. Under whey protein, we have the alpha lactalbumin and beta lactoglobulin. They are the major components representing over 80% of the whey protein. So beta lactoglobulin even more than alpha lactalbumin in concentration. And these are the two main proteins that impact the functionality of whey protein concentrate or whey protein isolate. When we talk about whey protein functionality, we mainly talk about the functionality of these two main proteins. Other than alpha lactalbumin and beta lactoglobulin, we have three other components, I mean many other components, but three of them, a serum albumin, lactotransferrin, and immunoglobulins. If we want to have a greater look at the composition, so enzymes, minor proteins, and here are your caseins and whey protein, and the concentrations. So 24 to 28 grams per liter, 5 to 7 grams per liter, and the total proteins in milk are 30 to 35 grams per liter. So under casein, again, there's the alpha caseins, the beta, and the kappa. The A, B, C, D, and A, B here, and all of these letters, these represent different variants, genetic variants of, the, of this protein, with a little bit of differences in the sequence of the amino acid in these proteins. So a lot of homology between the variants, but slight variation in amino acid composition and sequence. Okay, so under beta casein, you'll see the gammas, gamma one, two, and three. These are generated upon plasmin hydrolyzing beta casein. There's always plasmin in the milk, and there's always some activity. Then at any time point, there's always a little bit of these peptides in the milk generated by the action of plasmin. So because beta casein is the most susceptible to plasmin activity. So even a fresh milk will have that in it. Okay, so, and these remain with the casein because they're, they're the hydrophobic fraction of the beta casein. So when the enzyme break beta casein, when plasmin break beta casein, gives a hydrophobic peptide. And here the proteose pentone is the hydrophilic peptide. 
So the beta casein is broken. Part of it is hydrophobic. Part of it is hydrophilic. The hydrophilic remains with the whey when the whey is separated from the casein. And the hydrophobic remains with the casein fraction. Okay? So that's the proteose peptone right here is a fragment of the beta casein that got hydrolyzed by plasmid. Okay, so if we look at whey protein, you have the serum albumin, very low concentration. You have the immunoglobulins. And then you have um, immuno, um, the transferrin is not here for some reason. But then you have the protease peptone. And of course, you have the beta and lactalbumin and the beta lactoglobulin. And again, those letters are indication of different genetic variants. All right, I'm going to stop here. OK, remember, come with a question, each one of you, next week.